Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let me encourage you, if you feel comfortable, to move a bit further forward. It's hard to see everybody at the back. <laughs> it feels quite empty this morning, but um, hopefully more people are on their way. Good. Let me encourage us to stand together as well. And we're just going to take some time together just to reflect upon our God, our Savior, and to give him praise. So let's just spend a few moments in quiet to prepare our hearts. Father, I'm sure each of us individually are, are coming from different places this week. Some of us have had a, a tough week wrestling with different issues and challenges in our lives. Some of us may have had a great week. God, regardless of what our weeks have been, God, regardless of what our circumstances, we want to fix our eyes upon you this morning. God, if, if we're struggling and wrestling, God, when we look to you, we find that you give us strength. You give us purpose. You, you turn challenging circumstances into good for those of us that trust you and love you. And God, for those of us where you've blessed us this week in many ways, God, we want to reflect um, our thanks and our gratitude to you this morning as we worship you. God, we thank you that you are a God who is separate from our circumstances in terms of always being good, always being faithful. Um, but you're also involved in our circumstances too, to, to bless us, to support us, to strengthen us, and to use those things for, for good. We lift you up this morning. We, we, we ask that our, our hearts and our minds would be focused upon you, that you would accept not the words we sing and, and the way we sing them necessarily, but God, that you would accept the heart that, that is behind them. God, even if there are words that are hard for us to sing in this season, God, the fact that we make a choice to sing them, God, is, is, a, is a choice to worship you. And we pray that whatever the heart is in each of us this morning, God, that you would be worshipped and you'd be lifted up in that. We also ask that our music, our, our, our joy would be evident, um, that you would be lifted up and praised. Amen. Our God is for us, He never fails. He goes before us and lights the way. And every step He will lead us on. Our God is for us, our God is for us. He fights our battles, we overcome. And when we're weak, He carries us. There is no mountain He cannot move. Our God. Let's go back to the beginning.
every chain, break every chain. You take what the enemy meant for evil, you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, you turn it for good. We believe that. What the enemy meant for evil, turn it for good, turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, turn it for good. Turn, there is power. Yes, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. Every chain to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain to break every chain. Let me just give a few moments of quiet. And if there are things in your life that you're aware where there seems to be no way out, where there seems to be no way through apart from God, and it's just again, just declare under your breath quietly before God, that you put your faith in him, that there is a way out because of the power of the name of Jesus. Just surrender those things afresh to him. What the enemy meant for evil, you turn it for good. You turn it for good. As you take what the enemy meant for evil, you turn it for good. You turn it for good. One more time. As you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good, you turn it for good. And looking in the sky, whoever could deny your glory? Gazing into space, how small the human race appears. Seeing you in all your majesty, I wonder how it could be that you didn't lie in me. Lord, you are an amazing God. Lord, you are an amazing God. Lord, you are an to again. 
Ain't no other God or King is like you Powerful and strong yet tender is your song to me Knowing the extent of all my sin However could you be pleased Would you pour your love on me Can you pour Just one word, and you measure the mountains in your hand. Yet you treasure the broken and make them whole. Crown us with your love. You light up the heavens with just one. you are an amazing God. Lord, you are an amazing God. And I love you. And I love you. Lord, you are. Lord, you are an Just one word, and you measure the mountains in your hand. Yet you treasure the broken and make them whole. Crown us with your love. You light up the heavens with just one word, and you treasure the Yet you treasure the broken and make them whole. Crown us with your love. You crown us with your love. with love 
It's a crown that says who we belong to. It's a crown that tells of our worth, not because of what we've done, but because of what you've done for us. Oh, you crown us with your love. Lord, you are an amazing God. Jesus, we will never understand what it is that you have done for us. God, we know it's a complete and full deal that you have won. You said it is finished. There is nothing else to be added to it. It is done. And yet we know so often we can struggle to fully understand that. But God, keep us looking to you, God. Whatever circumstances we're in, if we're in, a, in the valley, God, may we look to you knowing that you lead us through the valley to pastures that are better, that you turn those things into good. You lead us towards something that you have in store for us. And God, if we're in a season of great joy and blessing, God, we know that's not because we deserve it. It's because you are good. You are love. You are faithful. Let us give you the praise, God. Let us give it back to you. Let us never lose sight of who you are and and who we are only in you. God, we love you. We thank you for what you've done. Help us continue to fix our eyes upon you this week. Amen. Just a few announcements. Uh, So, for anyone who is age 11 and over, up to an age where you feel comfortable to still consider yourself youth, a teenager, um, from age 11 and upwards, we're going to be starting our Youth Connect at the moment. We're going to give you guys a chance to come up with a better name, Um, but we're going to be starting to meet together as youth age 11 and up next Sunday after the service. So, for parents, we encourage you to, to plan that for your children. Um, It might give you a chance to go out as as parents. Maybe you can get together as groups of parents to go out for lunch somewhere nearby and come back at 2 o'clock to collect your teens. Um, Yeah, from 12.30 after the service until about 2 o'clock, we're going to meet and we'll have food for the the youth as well. So if you want more information, come and speak to us. The plan is is at this stage is going to be every other Sunday after the service. So not every week, but every other Sunday we'll get together. And we also want to try and plan some other fun events Um, to bring the youth together, maybe on a Saturday sometime in the month. But this time for the youth is really going to be focused on building connection with each other, learning what it is that God has to say about us through his word. So I encourage you to to come along next next week. Uh, The Men's Connect, Men's Bible Study, is going to start next Saturday. Uh, No. Saturday the 2nd. Two weeks. Two weeks, yeah. Um, So, yeah, 9 o'clock. Are we going to, are we at City Grill? City Grill. Okay, so at the Prima Primari, Primaveri, not Primaria, Primaveri uh, City Grill, which is right by Aviatorilo. Um, so if you don't know where that is, we'll make sure, come and speak to Bill or myself, and we'll make sure you know where that is. So men from 9 o'clock, there's a, it's a kind of a, a restaurant, we'll buy breakfast, and we'll each pay for our own breakfast and have a time of fellowship there together. Uh, in, this is next, no, this is the same Saturday. Sorry, I'm getting confused with my dates. The year's going too fast, but not that fast. <laughs> so again, in two weeks' time on Saturday, um, you may have heard of uh, Lou and Nathan Fellingham. Actually, we, just by coincidence, we've done quite a few of their songs. They're Christian songwriters. We've done quite a few of their songs this morning, and we have another one we're going to conclude with, which is a, a, a version of a classic hymn, And Can It Be, that's been rewritten. 
And they are doing a, a, live, a live concert. We won't be watching it live, just because of the timings, but we are going to have, we're going to show it here on a Sunday on the screens, um, kind of have a chance just to come together. And, and their, their concert this time is focused on, <coughs> losing my voice, is focused on hymns. And they're going to be doing some uh, classic hymns. They're going to be doing, like we're doing at the end of the service, a, a kind of fresh twist on an old classic hymn with the lyrics, but with a modern twist. Um, and they've got lots of hymns that they've done that with, and they're working on some others. Um, so I'm excited, and I think it will be a great chance for us to come together. Some of you who have been here longer, we, you know we have worship nights here sometimes on a Saturday. This is kind of going to be our, our worship night um, on a Saturday evening, but led by Lou and Nathan on screen. So I'm excited for that. It is going to cost... Um, so if you can come with about 20 lay or donation towards entry, I'm going to buy tickets in faith in advance that we have them, so that, uh, and then we'll, we'll show that. So ne uh, two weeks' time at 6.30. And finally, uh, on the 24th of October, after the service, we're going to be having a newcomer's lunch. We've done one of these before. The plan was to do them more often, but COVID has stopped us. So anybody here who thinks, considers themselves still a newcomer, which could even be going back a year or so ago because we haven't had one of these lunches, it's a chance for you to come. Uh, Bill and I will share a little bit more about the church, some of the history of the church, and some of the vision and focus of the church, and it gives you guys a chance to ask us any questions that you want to to find out more about the church, and a good chance just to get to know each other and fellowship more together.
that again. Am, am I on? Yes. Okay, it's blinking. I don't know if that means the battery is low on it or not. Maybe you can see if somebody can find a battery in the office there or something if we need it. I think there are two double A's. So, anyway, if you got your Bible, we're going to start something new. And so we're going to begin a new study through the Gospel of John. And I have to acknowledge something which is amazing to me. I actually went back and researched this to make, to make sure that I was correct on this. This past June actually marked, for me, 15 years here at the International Church. And during those 15 years, believe it or not, we have never actually taken Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John and actually studied through it. And so we're actually going to endeavor to do something we've never done before during my time here at the International Church. We're going to make our way through the Gospel of John over the next months. But in reference to that, I'd like for you to take your Bible and turn to the very first chapter. John chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 1, we're going to make... You know, technology is great when it works, but when it doesn't, we have to make do, don't we? Well, what I'd like for you to do is, uh, do we have a couple batteries there? Right there. All right, I appreciate your patience. I know this means that God's got something wonderful in store for us. Only Satan would work this hard to keep us from getting it. any better? Oh, there we go. To God be the glory. <laughs> All right. Let's get together now in John chapter 1. If you join me, let's begin in chapter 1, verse 1. There it says the following. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world. The world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. From his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known to us. You know, I think I want to pray one more time because there's a lot there. Would you join me? Father, take your word now and speak to us. Help us to understand the richness, the depth of the truth that you have here for us. And help us to respond to it 
in unity. God, may your will be done in our lives. Lord, help me to be your mouthpiece. I don't want to do anything that would be out of line with your will. May the words that I say be easy to understand. May they communicate truth, and may Jesus be exalted. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you a question. How many of you like Coca-Cola? Nobody? A few of you? How many of you actually drank a Coke? Okay, there you go. We got a lot more hands. You ever taken a bottle of Coke or had somebody take that thing, shake it all up? What happens when you shake it up? Pop that lid off. It is a mess, isn't it? I mean, it sprays all over the place. It's quite a sticky experience. You know, I got to explain as we get into this text that it's kind of how I feel a little bit. As we get into this, there's so much there that only by God's grace are we going to be able to make our way through it and try to come up with something that's actually going to apply to us that's going to make some sense. I know as I studied through it, as I dug into the truth of verses 1 to 18, it kind of felt like trying to take a drink, if you will, out of a fire hose. I don't know if you've ever had, had the experience of seeing firemen fight a fire, but you know those big hoses that they attach to the truck and they try to fight the fire with? Boy, if you ever try to take a drink out of one of those, not only could you probably not take a drink out of it, it would probably blow you down the street. I mean, it, it's truly amazing how much truth there is here, the depth of, of what God has given us here. And, and that's kind of how, how I feel this morning as we dig into it. There is an awful lot in this text, but God, by God's grace, we're going to make our way through it, and what I fear is, is that we're probably just going to scratch the surface, but as we scratch the surface, even in scratching the surface, I hope that we'll get just a sense of the truth of what God wants for each one of us this morning. You know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in their Gospels as they wrote them, it's interesting the way that they wrote them, because they really focused an awful lot upon the events of Jesus' life, what Jesus did. As you get into the Gospel of John, what you're going to see is that John takes a slightly different approach. John is different than what you call the synoptic Gospels. John focuses more upon actually what the events of Jesus' life means, what they mean about him, what they say about him as a person. John, as he begins here, he kind of gives us, this is what you might call prologue. This is kind of the beginning of the story. This is kind of the, the, the introduction, if you will, as, as he gets into it. And he uses a term that's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. In Greek, we call it the logos of God. What exactly does he mean? I mean, that's kind of a confusing term. It's kind of a confusing word. Why would he choose that? Well, I think you're going to see here in a few moments as we dig into it a little bit farther. I think our task today as we kind of make our way through this initial part of the Gospel of John is to identify, if you will, and, and to understand, to learn of the word's arrival and what it actually meant to us personally. You know, as we get into the Gospel of John, you're going to find some texts that are narrative. They're kind of stories. They're, they're telling us a story that we can learn from. And this isn't so much narrative. This is maybe a bit more meaty. It's, it's a bit more the meat of God's word. But the meat of God's word is vital. It's important to help us to become like him. So as we do, as we dig into this text, I want us to begin by asking a very simple question. Who was the word? Who was the word that's referred to all throughout this text? Who was the word? Why did he come? Well, as we begin, I want you to see who he actually was. We're going to try to identify him. We're going to look at the identification of the word. And to identify the word, we're, we're actually going to see four specific traits that are going to point us specifically to who this was. We're going to be unmistakable about who he was because we're going to see the traits that are going to point clearly to the identification of who the word of God is, who the logos of God is. You see, as you go to the text in verse 1, it begins with a simple phrase. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. Now I want to give you just a little bit more context, a little bit more information that's going to help us to understand what does he mean. Flip down or join me, jump down to verse 3. All things were made through him, made through the word. And without him was not anything made that was made. You know what we can kind of conclude from that? In order for him to create, 
In order for him to make all these things, he had to exist before, didn't he? He had to be there. So what we can conclude is that whoever the word is, he was there long before the world came to be. He was in existence. Therefore, we could say he is eternal. One of the first four traits. Let's move along to the second phrase. And the word was with God. And this is a fascinating phrase, especially when you look at it in the original portion of the scripture. When you go back to the original language, it has a depth of meaning that's just not communicated in the English language. When it says the word was with God, actually what it's trying to communicate to you and I is that this is like two very personal, intelligent beings being together in conversation, spending time in intimate fellowship. That these two beings, the Word and the Father, that they had grown in fellowship all throughout eternity. This is not so much the relationship, if you will, of, of a maid or a butler, two people who work together but really just don't know each other. Well, this is more kind of the intimacy of a husband and a wife, a fellowship that was only true between the Word and the Father. Thus, if the Word was in the presence of the Father for all of eternity, could we not conclude about him as well a second trait that he was divine. Well, let's continue on and look at the third phrase, if you will. He says, the word was there in the beginning. The word was with God. But then he says this, the word was God. Now, that's an extraordinary declaration. An extraordinary declaration. A declaration, if you will, of deity. That the word actually has deity in himself. You know, many have tried to translate that phrase and make it say something lesser than what it actually does say. There are many faith traditions that like to say that what that says is that the word was a God. And I don't want to give you a Greek lesson this morning, but what I can tell you is that the words of Greek grammar do not, the rules of Greek grammar do not allow for that translation. That is poor Greek grammar, proper Greek grammar only leads to one conclusion, that the word was God. And that would have been something that would have been easily understood in the days in which this was written. Because you see, as John wrote this, he wrote this to a Greek and Jewish world. As he wrote it to a Greek world, this would have been understood by those people. Why? Because the philosophers of that day, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, all of them, they all taught about this supernatural, superhuman being, the word. They all understood the concept what they didn't understand was that the word, the word of God, what they didn't understand about the word of God was that the word of God was personal. So when John says that the word, which we're going to learn about a little bit later, became flesh, this was hard for a Greek world to put their mind around. That was a foreign idea. That was something that they knew about. They knew that he was there, but the idea that he came and he was with us, that he was part of us, no, that, that was hard for them to put their mind around. But when John says the Logos of God, they understood. Because that was something that they'd heard from time and, and, he, and, and from all throughout their, their schooling. They, they'd heard this, this concept, and, and they were able to put their mind around it. So this was familiar to those who came from the Greek world. But can I suggest also that this was familiar to the Hebrew mind as well? That this is something that was taught all throughout the Old Testament. You might say, Pastor, why do you say that? Well, in Psalm 33, the psalmist actually declares that it was the Word who created everything that we see. That it was the Word of God who created the world, Psalm 33, 6. We also know, if you flip with me back now to Genesis chapter 15, I want you to see this speaking about Abram. God, if you, if you remember, he calls him to come to the land of promise. And as he calls him to come to the land of promise... He meets with him on different occasions. And I want you to see one of the specific meetings that he had with him. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. Listen to what it says. And after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram. Clearly, Abram would have understood what that meant. The Logos of God was meeting with him. And this was not just true for Abram. If you'll flip with me now over to the book of Second or to First Kings, to the book of First Kings, chapter 19. You might recall there, Elijah had been meeting with the prophets of Baal, and he'd showed them that there was only one true God. But after this incredible victory that he saw, 
he became afraid of Queen Jezebel as she came after him to take his life. Well, he fled, and he went and he hid in a cave. It says in 1 Kings chapter 19, if you flip over there, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9, the following. Then he came to a cave, speaking of Elijah. He lodged there. He stayed there. That's where he was going to live for a while. And behold, what? The word of the Lord came to him. This was a concept that would have been familiar to anyone who came from a Hebrew background. Thus, those in the Greek world, those in the Jewish world would have understood this concept. That the word, the logos of God, was not just eternal, that he was not just divine. But can I suggest also, he was almighty. Let me give you a fourth trait. If you continue on, if you go back to the Gospel of John chapter 1. Look at verses 4 and 5 with me now. There it says, In him, the word, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. The life shone, the light shone in the, in the darkness. And the darkness could not overcome it. What's fascinating to me about this is it simply points out two realities that should give us incredible hope. First, that the word, the light of God, chose to come into our darkness. He chose to come into this dark world that was desperate for hope. And he came down and he brought light to this dark world to expose the truth so that we could see it. But he didn't just come to bring light, did he? He came to bring life. He came to bring life for you and life for me. Life into a dying world as well. Not just a dark world, but a dying world. You know, it's fascinating. It says that he had life in himself that he was, so to speak, self-existent, which points to the fact that he is deity, that he is God, that the word is life. You know, how many of us would like for that to be true for us? That's something that is completely unusual, something that we just cannot identify with because life does not just naturally, self-existently exist in us. It's something that has to be given to us, granted to us by God. I know when we were in the States, we went there and, Natty has a, a, a kind of a solarium on the backside of the apartment upstairs. And, and there in the solarium, she has kept a lot of plants through the years. And while we were gone, she wanted um, some friends to come and water the plants and keep them alive. Well, as many of you know, we were gone for six months. And after six months of not getting much nourishment, not much water, and a lot of sunlight, you can probably imagine what we found, a lot of dust. My wife was kind of hoping for herself that her plants would have been self-existent and would have had life in them. But they didn't. The only one who does is the Logos of God, the Word. Thus, by him bringing light and bringing life that can only come from God, he does, if you will, the supernatural. He does the supernatural for us to point us once again to his identification, showing us that he is eternal, that he is divine, he is almighty, he is supernatural. He brought dark. He, he brought light into this world to expose the truth so that you and I could see it. Why did he do that? Can I show you something that I find incredible? If you flip with me over to the book of 2 Corinthians, I want you to see this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 tells us why he came as the light of God to expose the darkness, to show us the truth. Because you see, the evil one, Satan himself, the prince of this air, he is trying to do all that he can to keep men lost in the darkness so that they can't see the truth. And he wants to, my friend, if you don't know him this morning, he wants to keep you in the dark. He doesn't want you to see the truth because he doesn't want you to know the one who made you. Paul, as he wrote to those in Corinth, he pointed that out. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. Listen to what he's how he describes it. He says there, the God of this world, he's speaking of Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the what? The light. To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Friend, if you're here this morning, the word came to expose the darkness, to show you the truth so that you could see the answer. So let's see if we can't identify once and for all, clearly, who the Logos of God is. Who is the only man, the only man who is eternally divine, almighty, 
and supernatural in character. Who is the only man that fits that description? Would you not agree with me? We are talking about our Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ. And amen to that. Amen that he is who he is, that I am is I am. We describe him as both God and man, the God man who came to earth for you and I. Now let's talk about, now that we've identified who we're talking about, let's talk about the function, the function of the word. I want to show you three factors that, that impinge or, or, or three factors that, that, that actually show us how he works, what he does. I want you to join me now, if you will, go back to verse 6. There it says in verse 6, the following 6 to 8, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Christ, clearly, as we've just seen, was the heavenly word of God. But he came to expose the darkness with his light. Why was that so important? You might recall, you might remember these words spoken by the prophet. Remember, the world had not heard from God up until Jesus, up until the Messiah's arrival, the world hadn't heard from him in over 400 years. God had went silent for 400 years, and they had heard, heard nothing from him. But the prophet spoke of what the word of God, the logos of God, what Jesus Christ would do when he said the following, Isaiah 9, verse 2, the people who walk in darkness, what? They have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness... On them, a light has shone. You see, he came to expose the darkness, and John was the witness of the true reality, the validity of who the light actually was. And this, when we speak of John here, we're not talking about the Apostle John. What this passage here is talking about is John the Baptist, the forerunner, the one who came to set the way for the Messiah and his arrival. You see... The prophets Isaiah, the prophets Malachi, they had predicted this all along. And when the angel came to John the Baptist's father, when he came to Zechariah and predicted that the prophet's message would come true, everything that was said happened just as the scripture predicted. And then once John the Baptist arrived on the scene and he began to preach and call people to repentance, John predicted what the Messiah would do. He predicted his, his work, his life. That's why John said very clearly, if you flip over to Mark chapter 1, speaking of Jesus, Mark chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, after me comes he, the word, who is mightier than I, the straps of his sandals, I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I, I'm baptizing you with water. But let me tell you what he's going to do. He is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You see... The word came through the incarnation, which we're going to learn about here in a moment. But he did so to bring light into this darkness, to show us the answer so that we could clearly see truth and be able to respond to the truth because there was no answers up until this point. So the light was clear for each of us. John, if you will, if you've ever been to a concert, you might be familiar with this concept. John, if you will, he was the opening act. He was the first band to come and play. He wasn't the headliner. No, that was Jesus Christ who came to show us the way through his message and through his life. He came to testify, John did, to the light. But as we continue on in verse 9, it says, of the light, that the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet notice this. The true light, he came to expose the darkness, to show us the answers, to make truth clear, to make it easy to understand. But then he says in verse 10, how the world responded, the world that he made, he created the world, all that was made through him, yet what? The world, verse 10, did not know him. They didn't receive the message. He came to expose it, to show us, to show us the answers, to give us the gospel, but the world has rejected it 
Notice how his people responded to it, his, the, the, the Hebrew people. Notice how they respond. Verse 11, and he came to his own, to his own people, and they rejected it. They did not receive it. And you might say, well, pastor, I mean, if the light exposed it and he made the gospel clear and we can clearly see the message, we can see that the answers are in Jesus Christ. Why didn't they receive it? Why didn't they accept it? And I suggest that John makes that answer really clear. Go to the very next, or two chapters over, John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 19. He speaks of why the world doesn't accept the light. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people what? They loved their darkness. They loved their life. They love their sin. They love what their life is like right now. They don't want it to change. They don't want to be transformed. They don't want to follow Jesus. They love their darkness rather than light because their deeds, their life, the way that they're living was evil. You see, that's the reason why people reject even what the light shows them. But blessed be our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he has given hope to some. He's given hope to a remnant who will believe, who will accept and not reject the message that the light makes clear. How do I know that? Go on to verse 12. Go back to John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I think it's important to point out there, and I know you hear this over and over again, that every man, woman, and child who's ever been born is a child of God. Friends, can I suggest to you, once and for all, can we put that to bed? Children of God are those who believe in his name. A child of God is one who follows him. It's not someone who follows the prince of this air, of this world. He says, but to all who received him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, the light came to make the truth clear, to clarify the truth, to make it clear so that we could all see it. So that we could understand it. We could understand that Jesus came to die for sins. And that it's in his death, in his burial, in his, in his resurrection. That he won our victory over sin in the grave. And as a result of that, if I will simply in faith put my trust in him, I can know forgiveness of sins. And I can know eternal life. He came to expose the darkness, to show us that truth. To make it clear. To clarify it. So that there was no doubt about it. So that you and I could believe why was it that John was a witness of the light and the light clarifies the truth it was for that purpose and that purpose alone for belief and belief alone you might say pastor why do you say that go back now once again join me flip back if you will back to verse 7 he says there speaking of John the Baptist that he came as a witness to bear witness about the light but what does he say he bore witness about the light for what reason that all might believe that you might believe that I might believe that we might find grace in Jesus Christ forgiveness of sins and eternal life that's why the light came the light came to make the truth clear he came to clarify the truth in a dark world so that there was an answer so that there was hope so that there was hope for you and for me and he did so so that if we would simply believe we could become as John says his kids, his children. That's the function of the Logos of God. That's the function of Jesus Christ, the Logos of God. He came to expose the darkness, to show us the way, so that if we would believe in him, we could know life. I want you to see evidence that John didn't just know that, but he believed it with all of his heart. You see, as he wrote the Gospel of John, as he will later write his epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. That was his whole purpose in writing them. It was to expose the truth so that you and I could believe. Flip, if you will, to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 31. Listen to how John describes his purpose for writing the whole gospel. 
John 20, 31, these are written, this book is written, this gospel is written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. If you were to look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, you'd see a very similar statement that he makes there concerning the first epistle that he wrote. That was John's purpose, to bring people to belief, to bring people to the knowledge of the gospel, to bring people to the place where they could find forgiveness of sins and eternal life. That was the whole purpose, the whole function for the word even coming into the world, to expose the truth, to expose our deeds, to expose our sin, and to show us the answer that can only be found in the gospel. Friends, can I suggest that the true light, the true light has made the truth of the gospel clear. There's no murkiness anymore. There's no darkness bailing it. It is clear. It has been exposed. It is clear in his word. The true light has shown us the message, has shown us the good news of the word of God, of Jesus Christ. He has made it clear so that everyone can receive it. You can receive it. I can receive it. Here's the question. The question is simply this, friends. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Not just simply with lip service. Not just simply with your mouth. Do you truly believe? Do you know that you know that you know that you know that you have a relationship with the Logos of God? That you know Jesus Christ in a personal way? Because, my friend, there is no hope apart from a relationship with him. One of the best illustrations, one of the best ways that I've ever heard belief described by a simple chair. You see, I can believe that thing's made out of metal. It's strong. It's sturdy. I can believe that it will support me. At least I can say that. I might even, in my life, I might say, you know, I believe that this thing might be able to help me with my health. So I'll sometimes put my health under its control. If I have my wallet on me, I might even be able to say, I believe it might be able to help me with my finances, so I will take my wallet and I'll put it on there, and maybe it'll help me be more financially stable. I can trust it with different elements of my life, but do you know the only way I truly prove that I truly believe that that stool can do exactly what I think it can do? The only way I truly prove that I believe that it can support me i got to take a seat. Friends, if you believe, if you truly believe that Jesus Christ is the Logos of God who came from God to expose the good news to you, to give you hope, to give you eternal life, if you truly believe that, if you are truly following him, you will put your life completely, 100%, your health, your finances, your future, you will put it under his control. That's what belief is. So my friend, my question once again for you today, do you truly, do you truly believe it? Do you truly believe it this morning? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Logos of God who came to save your life? Let me show you finally as we conclude one of the most important if you will, concepts in all of Scripture. I want to talk finally about the incarnation of the Word. The incarnation of the Word. There are three things I want you to consider about it. That's a big term, a big concept to put your mind around. But there's three things I want you to consider. First, you're going to see the first thing I want you to consider if you jump down to verse 14. In verse 14, it says, The Word, Jesus Christ, is the one we've identified. The Word became flesh, and he dwelt amongst us, and we've seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace, full of truth. 
Friends, can I suggest to you that this is one of the most unfathomable truths, one of the hardest truths to put your mind around in all of human history. The fact that God of God became man. He came down to this world to be part of this. That's incredible that the infinite became finite. That eternity entered time. That the invisible became visible. The creator chose by choice to enter into what he made. To come into his creation. He willingly chose the Lord, the the word, the logos of God willingly chose to come into this world to become In a few moments, as Stuart described earlier, we're going to sing that great old hymn, And Can It Be? And in the second verse, it says the following words. I love them. It says, He left His Father's throne above, so free, so infinite His grace. Yet the Word of God, by choice, willingly emptied Himself. He emptied himself of everything but love and chose by choice to bleed for Adam's helpless race, for you and for me. He did that so that we could know him, so that we could have a relationship with him. He didn't just become a man willingly, but notice this. He willingly chose to dwell in our presence. As you go on there in verse 14, it says that he became flesh and dwelt among us. That's extraordinary. He didn't just come and live on some deserted island all by himself. No, he came and he took up residence right amongst us. He was next door neighbor with those in Jerusalem and in Galilee. He ate with publicans, with sinners. He had relationships with men. He came and he dwelt amongst us. You know, in the original, you know what that actually means in the original language? You don't get the full breadth of it in the English once again. You know what he's actually saying? Is that he set up his tent literally right here. It's like he went and pitched his tent and decided this is where I'm going to live. That's what he did. He did that for you and for me so that we could know him in a personal way. And he didn't just come and dwell amongst us. He allowed us to actually experience his glory. To see him for who he is. God of God. Who took on flesh. To experience the one who made us in a personal way. Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 17, they experienced that firsthand. But can I suggest that you and I can experience it firsthand as well? You might say, Pastor, how is that possible? Can I show you? Flip over to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This is extraordinary. What hope there is in this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. There it says, we all. Those of us who have a relationship with the Logos of God, those of us who know Jesus in a personal way, we all, with unveiled face, what? We behold the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed as a result of his glory. That relationship we have with him, the Holy Spirit residing inside of us, we are being transformed by his glory into the image of Jesus Christ, transformed into the same image from one degree of glory when you first came to Christ to another degree of glory, which ultimately you will see when you are glorified in his presence. You see, we all have experienced this. It's something that he's done in our lives. The facts, if you will, of the incarnation, that this is not just a historical fact that happened. This is not just something that happened in time where God came to earth and took on flesh. But he came and he dwelled amongst us and he allows us to experience his glory, to participate in it. That's why it's so very important that we appreciate what he did. But to just verify these facts, let me show you what he did. He didn't just tell us about this. But he actually goes so far as to give us reasons to believe that these facts are real. That they're not made up. You might say, well, why do you say that? Go back to First John or to the Gospel of John, chapter one, once again. There, in verse fifteen, he goes back and he talks about the witness, John the Baptist. Listen to what it says: John bore witness about him and cried out, "This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me." Verse sixteen: For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. You see, John 
he bore witness that everything that was said about the Logos of God is real. It's true. That the Messiah that he was the forerunner to, that everything that was said about him was real. That you can trust it. That he was, if you will, a, a witness to these facts. And that's why he pointed out the simple fact that once the Messiah arrives, he is so great, he is so awesome, that what? Remember what John said in John chapter 3? I must decrease. And he is going to have to increase. Because I am not him. But he is. And therefore, as a result, he must be the one that is worshipped, followed, and adored. Friends, can I suggest that John is not the only one who bears witness to the facts of the incarnation. If you know Jesus today, if you have a personal relationship with him, you know what it means to have belief, to have received forgiveness of sins and eternal life. You too are a witness. You too are a witness to the reality of Christ in us. Why do I say that? Remember what Jesus said to his disciples before he left? He says, I'm going to go to heaven. And when I go, I'm going to send to you the Comforter. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he will come upon you in power. And when he comes upon you in power, you then are going to go do something. Remember what that was? You're going to go and be my witness. You're going to go tell the world that the God-man, that God incarnate, has transformed your life. He's made you new. That the old in your life has passed away and all things have become new all because of the Logos of God who resides in your life. Therefore, it wasn't just John who was testifying to the incarnation. You and I, by our very lives, knowing Jesus in a personal way, we testify to the incarnation. And as a result... The facts of the incarnation being tested as true by the witnesses who have witnessed it. You and I, John the Baptist, they now can provide the impact. The impact that God wants them to provide in our life. What is that impact? Look at me. Look with me now at verses 17 and 18. John chapter 1 verses 17 and 18. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. What is he simply saying? He's saying this. Grace triumphed over the law. Under the old covenant, before the Logos of God came, before Messiah came, there was no answers. Men were walking in darkness, and they were waiting for the truth. They were waiting for the answers. When he arrived... Grace, once and for all, trans it triumphed where there was no hope. You might say, Pastor, why do you say that? If you will, join me and flip over to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Romans 3, 20. There it says in verse 20, For by works of the law. This is the law that God gave to Moses on Sinai. By works of the law, no human will be justified. Why is that? Because the law was never intended to justify us. It was intended to do what? Look at the next phrase. Through the law comes the knowledge of sin. It was there to show us that we are sinners in need of a Savior. But praise be to God. Verses 21 and 22 follow because it says in verse 21, But now the righteousness of God, the grace of God has been made manifest apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets, they were born witness to, the righteousness of God has come to each one of us through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. You see, the facts of the incarnation that are witnessed by you and I, that were witnessed by John the Baptist, the impact that they were made to, the, 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 the way they were supposed to impact our life is simply by this, to show us our sin. To show us the darkness that we are living in. To show us that we are in need of a Savior. And as a result, seeing my sin, I now can see the light. I was blind, but now I see. I can see the light. And as a result, I turn to him and I find hope. I find forgiveness. I find eternal life. 
You see, that's the, that's the glory of the incarnation that Jesus came where grace triumphed over law and truth brought clarity to the darkness where Jesus could boldly proclaim that I, the Logos of God, am the way. I am the truth, the life. And you nor I can go to the Father, have a relationship with him, except through the Logos of God, through the one who came to be hope for you and I, the one who came, the God-man, through the incarnation to bring hope into this world. So friends, can I ask this question as we conclude this morning? Have the testimonies. And I'm talking about when I say testimonies, I'm talking about your testimony, if you know Jesus. The testimony of John the Baptist that points to the reality that the Logos of God is real. Have the testimonies about the facts of the incarnation that we've pointed to, that he came and he dwelt amongst us, that he took upon flesh, that we've all experienced his glory. Have the testimonies that prove that the facts of the incarnation are real. Have those testimonies had their life-changing impact in your life? Has it changed you? Has it caused you to know that you know that you know that you know that you know Jesus in a personal way? Friends, I don't take it for granted in a room full of this many people that there are people here who may not know him. And friend, if that is you today, make certain your calling. Jesus tells us in the word to check our salvation, to be sure that we are in him. So friend, this morning, do you know that you know Jesus? you know that you have a relationship with him? Well, let's tie this up. How should the arrival, person, and work of Jesus, the word, the logos of God, how should it impact our life? Well, if you don't know him, if you don't have a relationship with him, the first way it should impact your life, friend, is he wants to bring illumination into your life. He wants to illuminate the truth. He wants to show you the truth in the darkness so that you can see your sin, so that you can also see that there's hope in Jesus. And once you see that hope, that's when he wants to come into your life if you will receive him. Behold, he says, I stand at the door and knock. And anyone that opens the door, I will come in to him, I will dine with him, and he with me. I will have a relationship with him. Those who receive Jesus, those that believe in him, will have a relationship with him. And he's come to illuminate the dark, to show that to you. But he doesn't just want to do that. Because you see, if you open the door, and he comes into your life, he wants to bring transformation to your life. He doesn't want to leave you like you are. He wants to change you. Just like we pointed out a few moments ago in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he wants to make you a new creation. He says, remember, behold, anyone who is in Christ, he is a new creation. Everything has changed. The old life, the life that I used to live, the old patterns, the old habits, they're gone. The old has passed away. The new has come. Friend, he wants to bring illumination into your life, but he also wants to bring transformation into your life he wants to change you he wants to make you like him and ultimately friends if we know him today if you've experienced the transformation that only the holy spirit can bring into your life you know what else he wants to do he wants to help you and he wants to help me grow in devotion he wants to help us to grow in love for him that our deepness of our love for him, our appreciation for the incarnation, God coming to earth, taking on flesh, might thrill our soul, might thrill our heart, and cause us to more devotedly follow him. Friends, there is so much in this passage. I know this morning that we've just scratched the surface of it. But oh, my desire is, is that as we understand all that God has done for us in Christ, that it might cause us, that it might cause our soul, our heart, to well up and worship for him and what he has done. Can I give you, as we conclude, just a little something to do as you go? I'm trying to get into the habit to give you things to do during the week, and this is kind of simple, but it's a way to help each of us who know him personally to grow in devotion and love for him 
to grow in devotion and love for the Logos of God who came to this world and took on flesh so that we could know him. First, if you know him and you love him, can I suggest there's only one way to really know him? You know how you know him? Right here. The word of God. Here, he declares his will. Here, he declares his heart for you, for me. I can't know him apart from this. So let me ask you this. How much time are you spending in this book each day? Are you truly, when you say, Pastor, yeah, I read my Bible. If I came into your home, could I write my name on it? Because that was the last time it was used. How often are you using this? Can I encourage you this week? Find five minutes. I'm not asking you for 30. I'm not asking you for an hour. Find five minutes and get into the written word. Just say, Lord, today, through your spirit, speak to my heart. Speak to me. Show me your will. Take five minutes and get into the word. And as you do, do this as well. Number two, each day as you do this, identify at least one way. Look, at one, look for one thing that applies to you. One way that this should impact your life. What you're reading. Because when he speaks it to you, it's not accidental. It's on purpose. He's allowing that truth to be revealed to you because he has something for you that he wants to bring into your life to help you to be more like him. So as you read, as you take those five minutes, say, Spirit, speak to me. Holy Spirit, show me how this applies. Help me to live it out. Find one way, not three, not five. Find one way that this impacts your life. And then finally, be careful to do this. Number three, be careful to thank him. Thank him. This is God's gift to you and to me. He's given this to us. These are, this is the instruction manual. This shows us how to live life and to live it in a godly way, to live it in a way that pleases him. Thank him for it. Every single time he shows you just a little bit more. He gives you just a little bit more, a little bit more of a glimmer of his glory. He gives you a little bit more of an understanding of who he is, a little bit more of an understanding of what he wants in your life and in mine. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for showing me your heart, your will for me. So this week, I'm not asking you for a lot. Five minutes a day. Find one application and live in thanksgiving. Thank him for what he has done. Oh, the glories of the incarnation of God. The fact that God became man for you and me. I hope that it thrills your soul as it thrills mine. Would you stand with me? I want to pray real quick. Father, thank you so very much for your word. I thank you for the truth that you've exposed us to this morning. I pray that as we have listened, as we have learned, I pray that our, heart, <coughs> our hearts have been thrilled by it. I pray that we have been drawn to you. We've been drawn to your glory, and it's caused us to want to know you more, to want to know you and follow you more deeply. And Lord, I pray also for my friend who maybe has never fully truly believed, who has never fully received you. Lord, might today be the day of salvation for them, I pray. And I ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you to have a, well, actually, go ahead and have a seat. I'm going to ask, if I can, real quick, if I could have Charles and Samantha and Christopher. Are you going to go get him? Okay. If I could have them come this morning. We have a special thing for them as we finish our time together this morning, and then we're going to sing. Many of you who know Charles and Samantha know that over the last months, they have had a wonderful new addition to their family. Little Christopher has come into their home, and as he has come into their home, it has blessed their home. And I'm sure they would probably say that it's probably even helped them grow. I know my wife and I can say the same, that as the girls came into our home, it helped Natty and I grow to be more like Jesus as well. But this morning, they have openly confessed that they want to give Christopher back to Jesus. They want to dedicate him to his will and the Lord's service in the future. So as they come this morning, we want to pray for Christopher. Christopher, you are a blessing, buddy. And we want you to know as a church that we love you. 
and that we want to do everything we can to show you Jesus. As they come confessing that they want Christopher to know and to follow Jesus, can I also suggest that that says something to you and me. It was once said, and I don't want to get into the debate on what's right about it and what's wrong about it. Somebody once said that it takes a village, can I suggest, to raise godly children. Yes, it takes moms and dads who love Jesus, but it also takes a church. It takes men and women who love Jesus who say, you know what? I don't know I want my kids to follow him, but I want other kids as well. So I want you to do all that you can to be an encouragement to this dear couple. I want you to pray for them. And when they have needs, they don't have to look elsewhere. Here at the International Church, we're going to be right there to help. So I want to pray for Christopher. After I pray, I have a blessing for him. And I hope that each one of you will do all that you can to help them as they endeavor down this road, as they go down this new journey with Christopher, leading him to the Savior, so that one day we can all celebrate as Christopher becomes an instrument for our Lord Jesus Christ and for his glory. Amen? Lord Jesus, we pray for Christopher. We pray that your spirit would work heavily upon his heart. That the truth of the word of God, the logos of God, the truth of Jesus, might become very real to him soon. That he would understand what it means that Jesus, God of God, man of man, came to this world to die for him, so that his sins, they could be forgiven, they could be covered by your blood, and that as he puts simple trust, belief in you, faith in you, that you've promised him eternal life. Our prayer for Christopher, Lord, is that you would come into his heart and life, and that you would transform him. Lord, I pray for us as a church that you would help us. As brothers and sisters, Lord, might we be an encouragement to this dear family. Might there never be a moment that they feel like they have fallen through the cracks. Might there never be a moment that they feel like people don't care. Might we be true brothers and sisters united in mission. And might we encourage and build them up. And Lord, might the end result be as we watch Christopher grow, that we see Jesus at work. That we see you glorified. So, Lord, we pray for Christopher. We pray for Charles and Samantha. We pray for them that you might equip them, that you might equip them in every way to be able to shepherd Christopher's heart, to lead him to you, to help them to see Jesus in their home. So, Lord, be glorified in this family, we pray. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Christopher, I've got something for you. And I don't know if you're going to fully understand this, but I hope one day this will be a joy to your heart. Our hope, our prayer for you is the same hope and prayer that Moses had for Israel many years ago. Our hope for you, Christopher, is that the Lord will bless you, that he will keep you, that he will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious you all your days that the Lord will lift his countenance upon you and that he will give you peace all the days of your life that he allows you to have that's our prayer for you Christopher and we pray that Jesus will have his way in your life and that you will become a mighty warrior for our savior amen we have a little something for you guys this morning got a few things in here hopefully that will Make Christopher very happy. <laughs> we also have something in here that we hope will be an encouragement to you guys as well. My wife, over the last years, if some of you are interested in it, come and talk to us about it. We can get you a copy of it as well. She wrote a book about our story of adoption and about our girls, and we hope that it will be an encouragement for you guys. And so we hope that God will bless you guys, 
and that we will celebrate soon our new little brother in Jesus. God bless you guys. Make sure that you take time to encourage Charles and Samantha and Christopher. Would you stand with me now? Stuart's going to come and he's going to close us in a song. I hope that you guys have been encouraged this morning. As we focus once again upon this song, I want you to focus, as I said, upon that second verse. I want you to look at those words. Matter of fact, let's just take a real quick second before they start to sing. Look at the words of that second verse. He left his father's throne above. The Logos, the word of God, he did that for you. He did that for me. He left his father's throne above. He came to the world and he took on flesh. He did it so free, so infinite. He did it with his grace, his love for you and me. He bled for Adam's helpless race. And he, he did this so that you and I could know him. So as you sing, reflect upon all that we have learned this morning. And might it cause you to worship him with all of your heart. Thank you. 
I pray that that truth would quicken our hearts, that it would encourage our souls and cause us to say, Lord, I love you, and I thank you for coming into my darkness. I thank you for exposing my darkness with your light, for showing me the way when there was no way. Might we marvel at your incarnation, and might it cause us to love you more. So, Lord, go with us and help us to live in the glory of what you have done, for the glory of Jesus, so that others might see you in us. And I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless each of you. Have a blessed Sunday afternoon. You're dismissed.